Uh, so I have to kind of tell a story about this, this next, next session and next speaker. Um, when we were putting together uh, sessions for the JNUC, we thought, you know, Marco did a really great job for us last year, and it'd be great to, ha to have him come back and, and do another talk this year. So I emailed Marco and I said, hey, um, you know, we'd love to have you uh, come up and, and do a presentation. What do you think? And he said, yeah, sure. Uh, and so I, I said, we kept talking through it and, and what we were going to be discussing. And I said, Marco, okay, just send me over a, a session description and then we'll post that on the website. And then we can work on the slides and get all of that done, done later and that'd be great. And he says, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. A week goes by, nothing. So I said, okay. I give him a call. Call over to Oxford. Marco, I need, I need some, I need, just need a description. Give me like two or three sentences, that's it. And I'll, I'll put it on the website. Yeah, I'll get it tomorrow and nothing, no. So this went on about three or four more times. And finally we were at a spot where Marco, I need something because we're gonna print up all the, the, uh, the pamphlets and, and we gotta have something in there. And so then he sent me what he sent me, which I'm sure you've all seen. Uh, we kind of looked, we passed that around the office a little bit and looked at it and just kind of said, well, that's, that's Marcos. So, uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let me present uh, Marco Young with the Egg of Columbus. Hi. Yeah, I think next year you get your presentation title in time so you don't give me such a hard time. Um, welcome, um, welcome from Oxford. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, second time in a row. JNUC is great. I love it. It's a fantastic event, and um, for me, it's especially quite interesting to come here because um, you all share the same passion for the same product. And um, before we start, I would look, like all of you just to give an applause for all the jump people which enable us to do our jobs so great. <laughs> Um, but now I've done the courtesy of saying something nice. Um, I think there's something wrong with your slogan, guys. You know, you're saying helping the enterprise succeed with the Apple platform. I think it actually it should be the other way around. So, yeah, I'm talking about the Egg of Columbus, and um, you probably all have heard it and you know what it's all about. Um, when Christopher Columbus discovered America, he was challenged that this was actually an easy thing. And because it was just crossing the ocean, and then, ooh, there it is. And what he did, he challenged then all his friends and benefactors he met for dinner and said, like, so if discovering America is so easy, can you make this egg stand on its tip? And um, they, they tried several times, and then they all gave up. And what did he do? He just tapped it on the table, voila. Okay, my, my talk is done, thank you. Um, so seriously, um, what I'm trying to do is to tell you not rocket science or really tricky stuff. I'm trying to tell you some easy solutions. If you think about them and you discover them, they're easy to apply. And probably what I'm going to show you is not something you can apply one by one, but it's something you can at least adapt. And everything I'm going to tell you is not my own work. Now, I work in a wonderful team of talented guys. Um, their names are they are Some of them left Oxford several years ago because industry is paying better. For those in education, probably feel the same pain. Um, but um, I feel very, very honored having worked and working with those guys. One of my colleagues is around. He will later join me for the Q&A on stage. Um, actually, all the scripts you see are mainly written by him because I'm... The, Actually, I have hardly any time to start coding. So this might be boring for the people which see me on other conferences because I'm always opening with the slides. I want to give you a short introduction to the University of Oxford. It's the oldest university in the English-speaking world, the second oldest at all. And um, it was founded in some form 1096, so older than the discovery of America. And, um, there were basically, Oxford grew when Henry II banned the English students from attending the University of Paris, which is the oldest one. And Oxford actually just aims to be one of the forefront centers of learning and research. 
And we are a charity, um, but we are a reasonably big one. The 2011 income was 920 million sterling, and the expenditure was roughly 910. The figures changed. Um, people reading European me media, like Guardian or so, probably heard that Oxford is making an annual loss of 70 million or so right now. Um, but however, we are quite good in still recruiting external funding. We have for 10 years the highest research in external research income. The university um, supports more than 20,000 jobs in the Oxford area, and um, we are very international. We have 41 international staff out of 95 foreign countries, and on the student body, consisting of 21,000 students, we have something like 43% international students from 145 countries. The most important fact I always like is um, if you get an Oxford degree, you're well in employment. 95% of all our graduates have a job within less than half a year. So now let's talk about size. We have 70 departments and 44 colleges because each student has to be affiliated with a college too. The colleges are basically um, all the social life and also all the tuition. So you go to the lectures and do the examinations at the university and the colleges does the tutorial bit. And one big advantage we have compared to most of the enterprises is we're located in one city. And despite we're so central in this one place, you can kind of compare Oxford to a large organization having something like 120 to 130 individual units, each of them doing whatever they want in IT and in all the other stuff, and then there's this big umbrella. And my team is in central IT, and we pro provide infrastructure services. And um, some numbers about that, just our backbone, so not the edge network, just the backbone has a daily traffic of more than 65 terabytes a day. We have um, 52,000 accounts. The weekly backup volume is something like 89, 90 terabyte a week. 1.2 petabytes of data, daily SMTP traffic, 50 something odd gigabytes. And um, we have something like 20 terabytes of mail we store in our mail system. So it's a reasonably sized organization. Yeah, and um, the interesting thing is, so we have 660 IT, registered IT staff. And these are the people which are in the individual units and central IT. And three years, two years ago, and last year also, I was part of one of three central IT providers. Uh, it was called Oxford University Computing Services. I kind of like, like like this, and now we're um, IT services, or as I call it, PC world. Okay, uh, enough about the organization. I think um, we need something, you need something more interesting about Oxford. Where is it? Uh, there we are. Um, Oxford is fantastic in terms of pubs. It's a small city, 120,000 people living there, but we have more than 150 pubs just in the city center. And this is the definitive Oxford pub crawl a poster you can buy in nearly every poster and tourist shop. It shows roughly 60-something pubs, so not even half of them, and there's a drinking game. So you buy this poster, get a lot of nice pens with you, and you walk from pub to pub, have a pint, and call it a pub you had your pint in. And the challenge is to do all these within three days. Okay, so let's get started. Um, today, my talk will focus about the whole life cycle management of a Mac. Um, and this is from procurement over commissioning over ongoing maintenance to decommissioning. And I will try to address all of these aspects over the next remaining 45 minutes and give you some ideas how we solve some of them. Let's start with deployment. And I would like to start with the challenge we're given by Apple. So just looking at the latest release of OS X, all of us had to deal since 3rd of October last year with seven, uh, six retail releases. But not that that's enough. No, they add on another seven hardware-specific ones. So that's 13 operating system releases we all have to deal with within 
the last year. So this brings us to imaging. And there are several techniques, and I, all of them have their advantage, and I think hardly anyone nowadays does thick imaging. Yes, it's fast, but keeping in mind that there are so frequent operating system updates, nobody wants to maintain a monolithic image containing everything, operating system applications, configuration, and so on. So that brings us then to the next one, hybrid imaging. Hybrid imaging is kind of a combination of thick imaging and thin imaging, so you have a rather big master image, and then you apply just changes as you require them on top of that, i.e. just certain applications you only need for a pool of machines or special configuration. And that's a rather nice approach, but still hard to maintain nowadays, I think. And then there's thin imaging, um, which is according to the definition I'm using here, which is actually from Microsoft. They have the best definition in imaging, in my opinion. Um, just a minimal base operating system you lie down on the machine, and everything else is deployed on initial on configuration or runtime. So you're super modular. And we decided to go with the minimal one, and I see a trend that people even go to the approach of not imaging machines at all. Um, I think there's something into it, saying that when you unbox a new machine, it actually comes with a wonderful, fine, freshly installed, clean operating system. But I will show you the reasons why we're not doing this yet. Our deployment strategy is mainly to start deploying even before the system arrives. So we register the computer to the JSS before it's plugged into the network. We take the Ethernet address, we register to the network and all the infrastructure it has to go to, and we create a computer record, including auto-run data. And when the system is unboxed, even a user can do this, plugs it into the network, push the magic N button, and the fun is our team is called NSMS, which was Network Server Management Services. Um, we then changed to Network Services or something like that. So push the end button, and um, netboot the system, and then we just do the thin imaging. And within this thin imaging, we also partition the hard drive. I will speak later about that. And when the minimal operating system is laid down, we reboot first time onto the freshly installed local system, and then we apply software updates, do directory binds, install configuration, additional applications, and a bit of Oxford branding. And that's super flexible, because we can modify that. And after that, the system reboots again, and we're in the daily use phase, where we take our daily inventory, users can use self-service to do on-demand software installations or do on-demand maintenance, and we do a weekly maintenance, which is our approach of maintaining systems whilst they're out in the field. We have a contract with our users which guarantees them that IT only modifies the system once a week on an agreed time. It's predictable to the user, and it's fair for us too because we can really do proper release management. We know this change only goes out if it's tested, and then it goes to the machines in a staggered way. We do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday releases, um, not sorry, deployments then at smaller departments on Mondays. If there's something wrong we missed in our rigorous testing, they will let us know and we can stop it and so on. And the result of this four-stage or three-stage process is actually that we have a very, very modular system. The partitioning, the operating system, the updates, and so on. And looking back at the 13 operating system releases we had within the last year, for us it's easy. Yeah? There's something on the horizon for next week or so. We will just change this one component and we're testing already, obviously, as all of you do. We see what, what works or doesn't work. But then it's just replaced this one single element, and all the rest stays the same. It's very good for lazy IT people like me that you don't have to redo everything from scratch. Or like, if you want to change jobs, easy, yeah? <laughs> so, partitioning. And that's actually something we were initially a bit nervous about when we decided we do this three and a half years ago. Sorry. You, know, you, uh, you all know that the Mac ships with just Macintosh HD being one big volume. But we are Unix geeks. We love it. 
And there's this concept of mount points. And we decided we split Macintosh HD a bit more because there is already this hidden recovery HD anyway on every system. But we modify the partitioning even more to introduce another volume. We call it local storage. Maybe not such a good choice on hindsight. Use something like user data. Um, but this is mounted as the user folder slash users. And thereby, we clearly separate the whole operating system with the software and its configuration from the precious user data. Makes it very easy if a system doesn't work. We spend just a certain amount of time on diagnosing what's wrong with a system. And if you can't fix it, we blow it away. The data's still there. So let's have a look at the thin imaging recipe we're using. This is a screenshot of Casper Imaging, just that you get an idea how few steps we have in there. And you see the majority of it are these black boxes, which are actually scripts. We love to have small scripts everywhere, just like hooks where we can attach small, nice things to. And having this approach makes it very easy to think about where does this minimal change belong to? Because we have for everything already a hook we can attach to. So in detail, we run a pre-script, build pre-install 10.8. And that does nothing else than locking the screen so the user can't use mouse and keyboard to interrupt the imaging, and then it pulls the imaging window back to the front. So if the imaging kicks in, nobody can put the board, push a board, you really have to unplug plug the power or something like that. And then the first stage of two partitioning stages kicks in, and that's the main partitioning logic. Then there's the minimal installation of the, box, uh, of the base image. And that's just the operating system installer, the latest installer. And then what I sell to you as branding is another package we will look into in, in a second. Then there's a post install, which does right now nothing, if I remember correctly, but we have it there just to have it. And then there's the partition stage two, which does just a minimal bit of cleanup. So how does it work? Casper Imaging starts, looks up the computer record in the JSS, gets the auto run data, which defines the configuration and stuff like that. And then the extension, uh, then the first partitioning script kicks in. And on the right hand side, you always see the stage or the status of the disks. So after this script, we then have a Macintosh HD a recovery HD, which is in our case slightly larger than Apple wants it to be, so it's not in the 600 megabytes, it's a bit more than double the size, because we want to have the option to later do something crazy like injecting Casper Imaging in there. So we haven't done it, but it's just, we thought as we deploy machines, we give us the ability to have a bit more space in this volume. And we have the local storage partition. Then the thin imaging comes with the operating system, and um, after that, we run the second stage of the partition. Because the problem is, it might happen then when, when we install the operating system that the recovery HD shrinks again to the original size. And this is why we have this small caretaking script which sorts it out and brings it back to the volumes as we expect it to be. And then imaging is done, final inventory, and we set up the first run script. Reboot. We're done. So I was talking a lot about scripts, and last time you didn't get much scripts, but there was a cool attendee which took at least the, the screenshots and made them available. Grab this URL. Um, we have already a bit of stuff released there, and if you pick me up during the next two days and buy me a lot of beers, or Robin, who's sitting by the way there, I spotted him now, um, we will put more stuff in there. I promise that by the end of the week, the partitioning script and everything else you're seeing here today will be on there. It's done, and we have the permission to release it this year. So where are we now? Partitioning, done, operating system installed. So let's look into the first run. And to remind, me, remind you of the strategy, I bring up a piece of the previous slide. And you see, we boot into the system, and you see you lock there. We lock the screen again. Then we do the active directory bind configuration, yadi, yadi, yadi. So let's get back to the recipe we had there earlier. There's this one package we also installed, the first boot post imaging lock screen. Robin likes long names. 
and I love them too because they have descriptive long names that you know what it is. And this installs two launch demons, I will only speak about one right now, and the script which does the lock screen. And this is a part of this script. And the main thing here is that we check if the jump first run launch daemon is running. And if that's running, we use jump helper in full screen to lock the screen. And maybe we're a bit too official. I think a coffee mug might be nicer than this icon. But we tell the user, hey, we're doing something to your machine. Be patient. And then all the magic happens. Because then the first run script, which is then delivered using the standard um, jump methodology kicks in. I don't want to go through the whole script because it's a couple of hundred lines, um, but some best practice for scripting. If you're all good scripters, by the way, and experts, you probably want to now leave the room and go to one of the other sessions because you might be bored. Start defining everything you will use in variables. Structure your code in a way that you do it in a logic that the stuff that can always happen comes next. So we have a lot of tasks that don't require a JSS connection we do next. Like we check if we're on the right operating system version because it doesn't make sense to run a script on a version that doesn't work. And after that, a few other things like we do some information gathering. Like is this a portal device or not? Then we run a lot of system setups to just make local configuration changes. Time server is here the example or setting the computer name to match the DNS name. Hundreds of them. Whatever you want to do, configure your system properly in the first run script. If it is not a mobile, hence an iMac or a Mac Mini or one of these cool new Mac Pros, um, we disable AirPod because they are all networked properly using Ethernet, so we disable it. I just don't want people to confuse machines being in multiple networks and stuff like that. It's hard to debug for our support team. And then we enable SSH, just jump SSH to be sure that it's running because Jump does it a bit too late for, for our taste. Sometimes we want to SSH in the machine very early and just read the log file. And you see, every command we run always pipes the output into a log file. Makes it very easy to do some initial diagnosis if something goes wrong when you're testing, something like that. And the user doesn't anyway notice anything about that. Then we enable ARD for our admin user and because we partition the drive, we have to ensure that users shared is still there. Because if users shared isn't there, some applications might be not so happy. And um, I see it's all pretty basic shell, well structured, and all in logical order. And all you've seen till now didn't require a JSS connection. So we do all this first. And then we test using curl, which is basically a command line web client if we can reach our JSS. And we do this several times in a loop, and what I really, really like, which I just found whilst doing the script, because I never saw it in a log file, um, our script gets bored. And when we have this, then we do the, the, the JSS dependent stuff. So first, we always do an enroll, because we had from time to time situations where it didn't really happen, so in running it again doesn't hurt. Then we flush the policy history for this machine. It's just we heavily rely on policy logs, and when the machine is re-imaged, we want to start the machine from, uh, really with a fresh record in terms of no policy logs for this machine in the JSS. Just keep in mind when I later talk about how we scope stuff in policies that if a machine is freshly installed, it has no policy history. And then we call a lot of triggers or actions. And that's one of the key bits I think we're not doing, or like, unfortunately, Jump doesn't really advocate. My favorite tasks.html is gone. But we defined keywords, and we have a lot of these. And we, we call all of them. And these custom triggers, we have them for all purposes. Software. We have one that says, and now I want to install software. And now I want to update software. And now I want to uninstall software. Or printers, now I want to install printers. Then we have these hooks for the system build, which we saw, build pre, build post. We have the same for enrollment. You know, this machine has been freshly enrolled. There's the enrollment trigger, and so on. 
for the weekly maintenance to print the post. And that makes it very, very easy when you build a policy to clearly define when it happens. And as we have this agreement to do stuff only once a week, we call these software installs, software updates, software removal, just at this time. It's a bit more work when you scope it, but therefore you have a way tighter control when things are happening. So let's look a bit more in detail how this software deployment might look. And um, yeah, 1996, Linux, Tor Linux Torvalds made a nice comment. He said, like, um, only Vims use tape backup. Um, just to give you the rest of the sentence, um, real men just upload important stuff using FTP and make the world mirror it. So probably he was referring to his kernel work. Um, we love tape backup, and we have a wonderful solution there for that in Oxford, which I would like to share. Um, we brand everything. So before Google started the Nexus brand, we branded our exchange service as Nexus. Um, and we brand our Tivoli storage manager installation as HFS. And when I accidentally say in the next couple of slides HFS, just think about it being Tivoli storage manager. So on the left-hand side, you see the JSS. On the right-hand side, you see our um, backup system. And then there's this Mac with the partitioned boot volume. When the software install policy is called, we take the client configuration, which is stored in some extension attributes like the backup hostname and the backup password. Use a script to take that and put that on the permanent partition because slash users or local storage will not be wiped when we reinstall a machine. So we can make this information permanent in a hidden folder on the slash users mount point. And then we have a slightly customized Tivoli installer which can pick up this information and configure the TSM client in background without any user interaction. Very easy, just a script, a package, run the installer, but it ends up on two partitions. Because if the system goes away, we still have the information how to configure it, and we just reinstall. And then when we come to the point where there's the scheduled event to take in backup, the client only sends the data we can't automatically restore, the user data, back to the backup system. And if something goes wrong, our backup system sends emails to our ITSM system, which is in our case right now request tracker, and our support guys look at it. If a machine has too many failed backups, we manually initiate a backup, or we inform the user of a, of a mobile device, can you really please do the clicking? I think it would, be, it would be wise if you do a backup. And on top of that, we run a lot of extension attributes to collect the status from the log files. And there's another nice solution, which probably a few of you are already doing, but maybe then it's a nice reminder. We do something which, which I call active extension attributes. There is often this crazy stuff where people have an extension attribute which collects some information and then there's a smart group finding this which then runs a policy which then has a script which fixes something and then there's a recon to get the information if it's right. Should I say this again? No. So you're running a script whilst you get this extension attribute information. So make the script at least attempt to fix it. If, it. if the script can't fix it, yes, report. Sorry, it's broken. But it is a script. It runs every time you do an inventory. So use the power of that script, fix it, and report it's broken. But only report it if it's broken when you couldn't fix it. So this is now to check if the backup scheduler is running. And this is already on GitHub. Um, first, we have a small function, which is a wonderful one-liner in org to check if the DSM scheduler is loaded and running by calling launch daemon and filtering it. And then the output of that is just um, evaluated into a value that we can later look at that. Having defined this function, because we need it twice, we call it. And then dependent on the output of that, um, we check if it's running. It's just like, is the value greater than zero? Okay, scheduler is running. So that would be standard extension attribute, wonderful, report the value done. 
But then it's where the active extension attribute kicks in. So if it's not running, please try to start it. And after we've tried to start it, we check again. And we report the status. Okay, yeah? Could we start it? I say, everything fine, has been restarted, this is the new pit. Or, sorry, didn't work, and then we can react on that. Then we can send a mail or something like that. But make your extension attributes smart, make them work for you. Okay, I hope there was at least one cool solution for you so far. So where are we now? Nearly everything done, I showed you how we deploy updates, how we deal with directory bindings. I haven't showed you how we deal with directory bindings. Sorry about that, I should quickly mention that. You saw all these triggers, build pre, build post. It's just a policy that kicks in at the very, very start of the setup of a machine scoped against the build pre trigger. But as we don't have one active directory, we have more like 120 odd active directories in Oxford because everyone has its own. Um, we just cope that in runtime by department or by location. So by doing thin imaging with a very, very modular approach using the power of calling distinct triggers for distinct actions so you can order the sequence, how things happen, way nicer than just having nice names like AAA, AAB, AAC, ZZ5 or something like that. Um, you structure it nice, you get it done. So let's dedicate some time to applications. And I have to start with a small rant about the Mac App Store. So we don't, we don't give out administrative rights to our users. Maybe that's a bit old fashioned or conservative, but we don't do it. And Apple, unfortunately, does such a good job in telling users what they want. And it's good, yeah? it's really good, because they tell users what they want, and thereby we know what, they, what we have to cater for. But they tell them they need the App Store. Unfortunately, there's a small issue with that. And this is the latest version of the App Store product usage rules. And um, it's quite important, there are two usage rules for the Mac App Store and the iOS App Store. And people tend to confuse them. So the problem is, these rules at least tell me, as far as I understand them, that if I'm an individual work, uh, acting in personal capacity, I can use an app on any machine I own or control, but I have to act in a personal capacity. And sorry, this is a workplace, yeah? We're an educational institution, so the second point is the relevant one. And there, we, as the university, have to license it either per system or per user. So, to me, that means that I can't allow my users to sign in with their individual Apple IDs where they buy their personal software. Because, yes, they're controlling the computer they're sitting in front of, which is, but they're working. So they're not acting in a personal capacity. And maybe I'm not a lawyer and I'm totally getting it wrong, so please, disclaimer, yeah, this is not the final definite answer to that, but um, we use it as an excuse not to allow access to the App Store. So, but this brings a lot of issues with it because people want these apps and they want to download World of Warcraft and whatever. Um, and our solution is to educate users about it. We, we, we tell them why we don't do that. We explain it and we ask them for just telling us what applications they need. And one countermeasure is that we have on each system in the core software we deploy on every system a really, really big set of applications that whatever file you get, you should be able to open it, at least as with a viewer. So bang on LibreOffice. It's a free Office application. It can open so many files and makes users so happy. They might find the user interface a bit old fashioned, but it's really good. Have a lot of plugins, viewers, and all this on the system ready so your users don't really have an excuse to say I'm missing something. And if they tell you they really miss something and they need it, then give them abilities to fix that. Either you provide an application or you enable them to do it themselves. But we have another important strategy. Um, as we are Unix fans, we believe in the good old Unix strategy of having one tool for, one, for each purpose. Not two, not three, not many. 
So we deploy one really good SFTP, FTP client, and that's the client we support. And we do this for nearly everything. And if the user isn't happy with that, there's always some folder in the home directory, like tilde applications. And that's another part of our service level definition. We own the Macintosh HD, and everything on this Macintosh HD is locked, and only IT can control it. And this is where we deploy the site-wide software. And then we have, in the user profile, a folder in the home directory, applications, which has a nice PDF, which explains why this folder is there and what you can do with it. Because, let's be honest, more than 95% of all apps you get nowadays are just drag and drop installers. And it doesn't make a big difference if you drag it into system applications or in a, a different folder somewhere. You double click and it will run. And this is where people can put the really important stuff like Angry Birds or Scuba Dive Lock software and all the stuff which you definitely need on your work system. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, this is the next big problem you have when you deal with the software you deploy and you don't enable your users to be admins. How many of these do we get every time? And um, there was a really good talk at Max Sysadmin. Um, Greg Neagle showed some strategies how to deal with that. And probably the, the best strategy, despite suppressing it, is just to make your users ring IT and tell you that there's an update and then package it. So we're not doing this. No, we have a, we have a solution for that. We try by, to not show the users any of these. We define a clear update cycle, and we facilitate auto-update features. There's a wonderful Python script out there which you can use to enable the Chrome auto-update. Um, we package Chrome now very, fairly, fairly, no, rarely, that's what I want to say, like once every quarter, and then in between, just Chrome does its job on its own. And we suppress the notifications using all the individual tools which are there, configuration profiles, MCX, or whatever a vendor has, like uh, Firefox needs a file, an ini file somewhere, and all this stuff. And if you don't want to do this yourself, there are even tools which build packages for you automatically, like Auto Package, which have a lot of update suppression already built in. It's just like, get it away. Because whenever there's an update dialog and the user can't update it, you get a lot of support calls. And there are some tools, and my favorite one right now is SugarSync. Oh, I really love SugarSync. Um, we had several support calls open with them, and we never made it through the firewall of the first line support team. And I told them, I really would love to soft deploy your software everywhere on all of our machines, but I need to be able to suppress the updates. I never made it to anyone's second line or so. I rang the headquarters, no, nobody available. So SugarSync is something we're no longer deploying. If a supplier doesn't want to deal with that and make a software enterprise aware, you have to tell them. And if we all tell them what are the requirements we have as IT professionals to make the application work in our environment, they will probably listen. And we're trying right now to make this at least part of our procurement decision. That's probably the best one. Speaking about this update cycle, we have this, we update the workstation only once, but we also have an update cycle for each application. And to summarize it, it's basically, we don't do every minor update, we can choose these, but we bring out all major versions and major feature releases. But the minor releases are to our discretion. We can choose that. So if an application has really cool new features and just one user shouts, we might say, unfortunately, you have to wait a bit. But we try to bring out all the major feature releases, and we only support the current and the previous version in terms of Office 2011 and 2007. So if somebody wants the older one, we can't do this because like supporting two major titles is already a lot of work. So it would be, as we're not doing Creative Cloud because our licensing team is not really happy about the licensing for education, we're doing CS6 and CS5.5. But we can't package the older C, the Creative Suite stuff. You know how hard it is to package and how much work it is. And on top of that, we have a very, very clear release strategy which is adopted from Debian. You see the Unix Linux theme going on in this talk, right? So, in, in addition to the stable channel, which is the majority of our users, we also have a testing and an unstable channel. 
the testing channel are the so-called friendly users, kind of geeky power users, which we know that they would feed back if something goes wrong. And in Unstable, it's just the whole development team, the Mac team, because we have to eat our own dog food and we have to suffer first if something goes wrong. So in this example, we have Firefox 24, in our case, ESR, a bit more conservative on new features, but all the bug fixes and security fixes in there. And then Firefox 24.1 ESR gets released. We package it, but we dump it in our unstable channel. Then we, in terms of IT, all of us install it and test it. And a week afterwards, we have a meeting, which is for us on a Wednesday afternoon, where we review which of these packages we have in Unstable can be staged down to testing. And Thursday morning, one of our team stages all the software from Unstable to testing. Stable is still unaffected, they still have 24.0. And then the week after, okay, no problems reported by our friendly users, the, this package goes out to Stable. And then there's a new version, like a beta, because we have some issues with the PDF plugin, as I see in 24. So that beta goes through the cycle. It's a, it's a lot more work, to be honest. It's a lot of clicking. But it helps us to deliver a rock-solid platform. And that's actually one of our selling points. You know, we want users to be able to work without the technology being in their way. And non, not working applications are probably a big issue in terms of productivity. So here I have to ask for, um, I have to give you my apologies. Um, these are JSS 8.7 something screenshots because we're still running JSS 8.7. And um, these are the screenshots from a presentation I've given this before, but it's, it will give you the idea. This is the um, whole anatomy of one of our update policies. And we stick to the Firefox example. So on the general tab, the important thing to note is that it's triggered by this software update trigger. And the frequency is to run this once per computer. We only need to update Firefox once on each machine. The next one, the scope, is very, very important. It's a smart group. We, we scope every policy against a smart group. And the smart group has the same name as the policy, and they always indicate which release channel it is. As you can see here, testing. And this smart group basically captures, is a Firefox installed, and is the version not the latest? So when I did these slides, this version was the latest. But we have another nice thing, which is then the test against the release channel, and we have an extension attribute which we call uh, installation and patching. Because if you flick just one extension attribute on a host record, you know these custom built extension attributes you can have where you can define your own drop downs because extension attributes don't have to be scripts. They can also be user input. We have one of these on each computer and if you just flick this one extension attribute, the machine does no patching at all. Quite nice if a researcher rings you and says, um, by the way guys, um, I have this paper out in two weeks and you made my machine reboot and I really didn't like it because my calculations had to restart. So this is then our aim to stop this. So this smart group finds then all machines which don't have the latest version of Firefox, and then we uninstall all previous versions and install the latest. Very easy. And because we like to keep the users informed what we're doing to the machine, then there's a small notification script which uses Growl, which says, hey, you've got a new version of Firefox. Maybe you want to restart the app to avoid unexpected side effects. Another nice benefit from using smart groups is whenever you go on a computer record, you will see which updates are due. I know now you can see which policies would run against the computer, but when we designed that, it wasn't there. Very easy, very structured, and we have for each kind of policy, an installation policy, an update policy, we have an internal document which clearly defines how it has to look makes it easy, very standardized, and you can switch off your brain and just follow the documentation and do the clicking. So, whilst deploying software, I think one 
key thing we take very, very serious is also dealing with plugins. All the essential stuff people would like to have. Everyone wants to have this wonderful Flash stuff, and then the people have to install Flash blockers in their browsers. Um, Skype, Google Hangouts, things everyone uses like Xquartz, um, and Java. We have a lot of plugins pre-installed that also all the stuff you would expect to, have to work on your home PC or Mac should also work on your workstation network. And we're deploying both. Java Runtime Environment 6 and Java Runtime Environment 7. Because Oracle does a terrific job in packaging Java 7, it's very easy to deploy and update. It's just always taking the latest package and installing it. And that brings us to the security nightmare of this year, um, the Java Browser Plugin Saga. It is not a moment where Robin will really shine because like, I came once to his office and said, like, Robin, we really have to deal with Java plugins. And um, we talked about it, and then after like a couple of minutes, he's like, no, that's, that's crazy, no, we can't do this. And then one and a half days later, he, he just sent me a mail because I was, was not in the office, and it's done. So the interesting bit is Chrome is a 32-bit app, so it can only use Java 6. And I haven't heard from Google that they will release a 64-bit Chrome fairly soon. Um, and Apple does a good job in disabling Java 6 fairly often for us. So we shouldn't worry too much about that. And then we have Java 7 for Firefox and Safari. We deploy all three browsers and we keep all three browsers up to date because people really need, love their browser and they don't want to change the browser at the work machine. So when we deploy the Java browser web plugin, we run the Java 7 installer and then we run a really cool script that just disables the browser plugin. So there's Java 7 installed, you can run native Java apps, you can even run applications which are web starts, just the plugin which runs applets. So the stuff hardly anyone uses except the evil guys is disabled. And we do this on every machine. And when we discussed that, we thought, oh my God, we have a lot of support requests because Java doesn't work, because in education, there are actually a lot of Java applet teaching tools. But we haven't got hardly any. So apparently nobody misses the Java browser plugin. Applets are apparently on their way out. And to check if that worked, we have an extension attribute which collects that back. So we know in the JSS what's going on. But in case we have this confused user saying, hey, where's this nice thing I had in my browser? What's going on? And then he rings IT and says, hello, IT. And um, as this particular instance of IT guy is also very lazy, but also efficient. He goes to his JSS, has another one of these wonderful custom extension attributes, where he can just flick the drop down to browser plugin access enabled, hits save, job done. That's all IT has to do. Can, first line support can do this. Find the computer record, make the user aware of wh what he's asking for and why this is really bad in our opinion finds the computer record, changes this drop-down, job done for IT. And then our friend Self Service comes into the game. And we love Self Service. It's wonderful. You can push your work to the user. And this is how you have to think about it. Do I really have to do this myself? Or can I somehow enable the user to do this? Because then you have to write just a nice knowledge base article and explain how to do it. And people love to do things themselves because they have the feeling they're in control. So, when this browser plugin access is enabled, there's a new self-service item which we call the Java Browser Plugin Master Switch. A really catchy title. So when you click on this, you get this. And it will say, oh, Java is really, really bad to run in the browser and you shouldn't do that. And in my opinion, it should be way longer, but um, probably the short message gets it also across. And the user can say, oh, no, I don't want to do this or I want to do this. And when the user clicks on Enable Java Browser Plugin, we enable it on the machine again. So how does it work under the hood? Obviously, it's a self-service item, so we're running a policy. That policy runs a script. The script will analyze if the Java 7 Browser Plugin is enabled or not, and display the dialog accordingly. And depending on the user answer, we change local Java configuration and report it back. 
And obviously, the script is smart enough to deal with both ways. And hopefully, the users will be aware enough to switch Java, only, uh, Java applets only on if they need it. Very nice solution, very easy. It's a policy and a script. You can sell that very well. Oh, no, it is an extension attribute. Um, but very, very nice to deal with. This code is also on GitHub, and all the credit goes to Robin. So they're yeah, actually done. Whole lifecycle management except decommissioning. But as we're short on time, let me just give you one advice. We have configurations in Casper Admin to wipe and reinstall a machine back to the out-of-the-box standard system. So when you decommission a machine, have a policy which runs a script, which securely wipes all data. I don't know if FIPS compliant nowadays is so really trustable, but we do a multi-wipe. Um, and then we install just the out-of-the-box operating system that came with the system where it has been licensed. And there's a wonderful tick box you can check to even show the setup assistant. Thereby the system is decommissioned. That's nice if somebody has the pleasure of taking a work machine because it's 17 years old at, uh, back to home or something like that. But get the work data of it. You know, there might be confidential data on it. So before we get to the Q&A, just some final thoughts on user experience. Because um, this small web company you might have heard about has these 10 principles on their website. And um, they, they wrote them when the company was really, really small, like in the two-digit employee count, head count. And this one was there always and hopefully will be there always. Just focus on the user and all else will follow. And there are a lot of people which have written really, really cool books on user experience management. And I don't understand this, I'm sorry. But you can boil it down to something very more simple. <laughs> and all I want to say is, if you manage systems quite tightly as we do it, put the user still in the focus of your work. Because if you have happy users, you tentatively get more good work, you get less support calls, and the experience should be as close to what they have at home. So the real out-of-the-box experience. Not being an admin is probably not so much out-of-the-box, but as close as it can get. We do a very light touch in terms of how we modify the system. So this is the standard desktop you have when you through setup assistant. And this is the Oxford standard desktop. Not much change, just some productivity apps, virus scanner, and that's it. We don't change defaults because, as I said, Apple is very good in telling the user what they believe is the best for them. So all the defaults are nearly the same. And then something I already like, touched on three or four times, keep everything predictable. Now we're, we're talking about this weekly maintenance. If the user knows Wednesday morning at, at 10 a.m., IT will modify my system, they will probably not go in doing the most critical work. Maybe they even save all their work and go into a meeting because they know it's happening. And so what happens, we have a local launch daemon which then says it's maintenance time and the JSS then sends all the policies. We call software update, software in software install, software update, and software removal. Sell self-service as your in-house app store. Make it nice. Make it shiny. Offer a lot. Tell users to search for their first before they go down, go down the route downloading the software and, and putting it into their local applications folder themselves. By giving them the guarantee that if they get it from self-service, you take care of the updates. Saves them time, very convenient. Make it well structured. Have, have nice categories. Make long lists. Let it be descriptive. Make it just discoverable. Like we deliver licensed software. You ring IT or raise a ticket. You say, I've purchased a license for VMware Fusion out of my research grant. You give us the version. You give us the serial number. Seconds afterwards, it's available in self-service. Or the click of a button, it's installed and licensed. That's easy. If a power user feels like power user should get updates, 
enable them to install the updates earlier because maybe the user was waiting for this update since ages and then there's this stupid, unstable, testing, stable thingy nobody likes but us. But they can click on it and then it's there earlier. Just doesn't hurt, makes it nice. And have a lot of small tricks available where they can help themselves. So you already saw the Java web plugin master switch. Um, we have other nice things like Spotlight sometimes has hiccups. Click of a button, Spotlight re-indexes. Run Apple software updates. There's this new version of iTunes and I want this feature and do it. Printers. A printers might not work, something is broken. Bang, click, all printers deleted, reinstalled. Printing works again. Network volume's gone, bang, click of a button, they're mounted again. Oh, may I just use you here? Has anyone trouble mounting a lot of SMB volumes on 10.8, like randomly dropping? And then you have to restart the Mac to get it working again? I saw one hand. Oh, okay. So I'm, I haven't touched on this new thing, but I've been told that this fixes it, so. <laughs> okay. So let's wrap this thing up. Um, I know this was a very, very brief overview, um, but it was mainly to give you some ideas what, what you can do or what we do. Out of the box experience with a really, really well locked down Mac. Good pre-configuration, but you don't have the App Store, no, you sell self-service as your App Store. You take care as IT of the updates and thereby taking the burden away from the users also to get all these other infrastructure things working. You automate a lot of tasks and you keep their data safe. And for each of these, there are a lot of solutions out there in Jump Nation and not only in our Git repository, but there are way better ones out there. Think about the Casper suite, especially as the, J the JSS of something like Lego. Lego. You just have kind of these individual cool colored building blocks and you can build whatever you like because just the imagination, you know, your imaginations are the boundaries. And what you've probably hopefully seen over the last 50 minutes is that if you put these together in the right way, you can make really clever, easy things to make your user's life way easier and enjoyable. Thank you for joining me. I hope you didn't fall asleep. And do we have time for questions? Okay, maybe Robin, just that you know. So Robin is here also the whole conference. I ask him on stage that you also know his face because um, there we have two people you can ask with all your questions. So do, does anyone have a question? Did you post the public again? Yeah, it's coming up in a second. Okay. But first here, go to this talk, it's fun. Um, no, it will be, we'll be there. Um, another one? Yeah. So the question was that, um, unfortunately, command line switches of, uh, in, might change, and how we de deal with this. So you saw this example that we have in the build process, a script per version. That's code duplication, yes, I know, um, and it's not nice. We aim for reusable code, and then we have like just like these cases, is this 10.6, 10.7, 10.8, but actually, we are nearly there, right? I think less than 10 machines running on, on something older than 10.8. Yeah, so I think the, the first thing is that we, we try to be consistent across having all our machines on one version, but um, yeah, we've, it doesn't happen a lot, but it happens sometimes, and sometimes we've taken the approach of just having um, a different version of a script or sometimes just a case inside the script, but it, it doesn't happen all that much. Usually it's just a particular thing, and then you- But MVP is painful. So whenever you write something, just keep it consistent and announce it at least months in advance that your command line switches change if you're a software vendor. But one, I could add that one thing, we often make sure we check at the beginning of the script that 
the version of the operating system is what we think. So if the script gets run on a future version, which might break something, the script will just not run. So. Uh, wait, I had one here. Okay. Go for it. Well, maybe you should talk about this because it's sort of <laughs> a mix of future how, and, how and do, no, okay. The the current status is that um, we just use uh, for minor releases the weekly maintenance to install basically what was a combo update, and um, we all have seen this wonderful announcement about operating system updates for uh, which comes in the next JSS release. Um, I was always a big fan of re-imaging when we do a major upgrade because our supporters do a terrific support job and often they make local changes because they have an admin password. And that was kind of the handle to keep that amount of local changes low because when the machine is re-imaged, these local changes are gone. And I love it because thereby they have to report it back to us and Robin and I can write some scripts to make the local changes uh, persistent. But um, for 10.9, we decided we will do an in-place upgrade using self-service. So we're going for a strategy that every two years we will re-image a machine, but otherwise we do a user-initiated upgrade. I've just been told that um, we are running out of time. Um, Robin and I will be hanging around the whole conference. So please ask him all the questions because he knows all the stuff. Um, I hope you're having a good time. Thank you once more.